Welcome everybody to today's um, Zoom webinar. Uh, our speaker today is John Ionides. Get your information here. So, jo so John is a professor of medicine of epidemiology and population health um, in Stanford, and he's a co-director of the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford. Also, oh, also statistics. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. So the, I'm going to ask you the first question I've asked all our speakers on COVID and give you a chance to say a little bit about yourself. Uh, and if you want to show some slides, you can do that too as well. So the, the, I usually ask our speakers on, on COVID-19, what is your expertise? What makes you an expert on COVID? How do you determine who's an expert and why do you read to stay informed? Thank you, Asha. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, to join this q and I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that you're organizing this. Um, uh, well, as, as you know, I'm, I'm probably not at good uh, terms with the term expert. Uh, uh, the, the least probably uh, likely to deserve this term would be myself. I hate to, to be called an expert in a sense. I'm, I'm just trying to find some evidence and some data on whatever I'm working on. But um, my, my background, um, uh, has some relevance to COVID-19. My, my main training as a, as a physician is in internal medicine and infectious diseases. So, you know, my, my specialty is infectious diseases. Um, I'm very much interested in, in data, in, in evidence, uh, in how you can integrate evidence and uh, uh, try to make decisions based on evidence. So, you know, COVID-19 COVID uh, being a pandemic and an infection, um, I thought it was impossible not to, to try to deal with it <laughs> with all my lack of expertise. <laughs> okay. All right, good. So the audience, feel, remember, to, I forgot to say this at the beginning, if you have questions, use the Q&A, don't use the chat. All right, so let's get started with some questions. So I'm gonna, um, you've, you've wrote a lot and, and um, op-eds and have some manuscripts on, up on, on the archive, which I've, read and many people have followed these, these I'm going to ask you some questions about these now there's a little bit there's going to be a little bit of hindsight on, on some of these questions but here we go anyways so on March 17 is when we're, we're all starting um, you wrote a piece for Stata and in this one you say that this is this is one of the first uh, uh, controversial pieces I guess that you wrote is a fiasco in the making coronavirus pandemic takes hold we're making decisions without reliable data. That's the, that's the title. And one of the points you, you make is that there's better information needed to guide decisions and actions of monumental significance and to monitor their impact. So that, so my, I guess my first question is now, do you think that we now have enough information or more information to, to make recommendations? And I'll, I'll ask you a very specific question. And it's if you have recommendations or predictions about Arizona, Florida, and Texas, where the positivity rate is skyrocketing past 10, some places even 25%. Mm -hmm. We have far, far more information compared to you know, March when I wrote that paper. I, I think that we have learned a lot about uh, the virus, how uh, rapidly it can spread, uh, how many people it can infect, uh, uh, what its uh, infection fatality rate uh, in different settings and in different age groups and in different situations, uh, what are high risk settings and high risk of vulnerable individuals, um, what measures we can try and, and what might be likely effects of, of these measures. Uh, we have clarified some of those that we're probably having very little evidence when we started. We have more evidence on them now. So I, I think that we had a vast mobilization, mobilization of the scientific community over these uh, uh, four months, and we have learned a lot. I mean, I, I can't think of many other disciplines or many other research questions that, uh, you know, science rose to uh, the occasion to, to deal with it uh, and create evidence, create data, create knowledge. So, so I, I think that, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of scientists need to be congratulated for, for all the data that we have accumulated. Now, you mentioned specifically um, some states in the US that, that currently have a, uh, a recrudescence of epidemic activity. I mean, there's clearly an 
the recrudescence of epidemic activity. This means that we have to be very cautious. We have to be very careful uh, with uh, these situations. Uh, we have to probably dial back on our steps of, uh, of reopening. We have to be very cautious with using effective measures to stop the spread of, uh, of the infection. And we have to use the evidence that we have on risk gratification to clearly avoid having the infection reach, reach high risk settings and high risk, uh, high risk individuals. I mean, we, we know from what has happened so far that in the US, but also in, in most European countries, about half of the deaths, for example, have been nursing homes. Uh, in the US, the proportion is about 42 to, uh, actually 45 to 53 percent. In many European countries, is even higher. In Canada, probably it's even higher. Wait, um, sorry, can you say that again? What, what's, the, what's the percentage in the US? In, in the US, the, the percentage seems to be 45 to 53 percent. And in, in most European countries, it seems to be at least at large or even larger. And Canada also seems to be uh, even larger. So there's, there's really absolutely no reason why we should not protect nursing homes with draconian measures, uh, with testing of personnel, with, with very strict infection control and hygiene. There's no reason why we should not protect our hospitals with very strict infection control measures and um, uh, again, avoid nosocomial infections. There's no reason why uh, we should not use all we know about uh, the, the package of non-pharmacologic interventions to to try to stop uh, spread of the infection, especially in situations where we have recrudescence waves. Um, so I, I hope that if we use the knowledge that we have accumulated over these four months, um, we can do much better. And even though you see very large numbers of infections, uh, hopefully the number of deaths will be nothing compared to New York City. Um, now, if, if we repeat the, the same, I, I'm not sure I would call it mistakes because mistake is if, if you do something that you know how to do it correctly and you do it wrong. But if, if, we, if we fall into the same trap and allow high risk individuals and high risk settings to be devastated, obviously the, you know, the consequences would be completely different. So do you, like, do you think that, that these states should when you say they should walk back some of the openness, you think they should lock down in terms of closing down business and making people wear masks? Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that we, we can be more surgically precise uh, currently. Uh, I, I think that uh, back in, in March, lockdown, uh, draconian lockdown, uh, was really the only option because we, we had no clue exactly what we were dealing with. Uh, and you know, this is what I wrote in the stat piece. The, the range of uncertainty is tremendous. It could be anywhere from like 10,000 people dying in the US, which is not something that is that uncommon. It's, it's kind of a garden variety situation, all the way to 40, 50 million people dying, uh, which is the complete uh, apocalypse. And, and when, you, when you have such a situation, the only thing that makes sense to do immediately is to take the complete apocalypse as a possible scenario and, and go for draconian lockdown. I mean, just shut down everything immediately, no second thought. Now I think we can be more surgically precise. Uh, so I, I would heavily invest on protecting anything that is at high risk. You know, nursing homes, hospitals, uh, shelter homes for homeless uh, people, uh, prisons, uh, uh, you know, certain jobs that are, are at a high risk like meat processing plants, the problem is that COVID-19 is a disease of inequality. You know, there's lots of, of people who are poor without health insurance who are at, at risk out there. Many others who are uh, essential uh, job workers, low wage workers that are, are highly vulnerable because of the exposures that they get. Uh, we need to work more precisely to protect the settings that can lead to the highest morbidity and mortality. At the same time, you know, we, we need general advice to the population to be extra cautious. So, uh, you know, if you see epidemic activity, I think it's foolish to say, uh, you know, we just go back to completely normal. We have mass gatherings. We have, you know, that, that's, that's not the way to, to deal with it. Even for low uh, risk people, uh, we need to be very cognizant of the risk and vigilant and, and think of, of the infection potentially spreading to those who are high risk. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so a related question from an audience member. This might be a bit uh, too general and vague, but I'll ask it anyways. How, how best to know 
if you should stay home or go out. This is coming from Brazil. So their president yeah. just, got, just got announced as having a positive test. Okay. So, <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. It just came out <laughs> that uh, Bolsonaro has, is positive for COVID. <laughs> So this is a person who has a positive test. No, no, I'm saying the president of Brazil just just announced he has he's positive. Oh, and okay. This is, this is a, this coincidentally, we have a person from Brazil asking. Ah, he should stay home then. Stay home. <laughs> <If you're, Okay. laughs> there's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, mask, stay home. Okay. So yeah. last week we had the state epidemiologist. I think you. I think I think I think you answered the question. Um, but I'll ask you anyways. So a quick question. So in, in Massachusetts, we had our, our state epidemiologist uh, join us last week. It was a very interesting uh, conversation. And they, uh, they told us all about how they, they store data, how they share data, how they organize it. It was quite interesting. You can watch it on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, and they, Massachusetts was one of the first to, to, to decide, decide on the lockdown, but I, I originally thought based on what I have read from, from what you've written that, that you were not necessarily in favor of the lockdowns, but now I think you are. I was going to ask you what you thought about Massachusetts early, um, but I'm, I'm now thinking you're going to say that it was the right decision, but go ahead and tell me what you yeah. think. Yeah, uh, I mean, there. when we had no knowledge uh, about what exactly we were dealing with, I think that lockdown was the right decision. And I, I gave multiple interviews in, in March uh, in very different languages. I, I referred to some of them in the debate paper that I wrote uh, uh, for a debate with, uh, with Nassim uh, Taleb, uh, which is going to be in the International Journal of Forecasting, and it's, it's available online if uh, people want to take a look at that. So I... I, because some people questioned, and I think mostly me, in social media, that, oh, so Johnny Anita says just don't do anything, which is <laughs> completely different from, from what I was saying. I was saying that the pandemic is, is, uh, is, is rising and, and we need to, to, to act. Uh, but once you go into complete lockdown, you need to be able to revisit uh, and see what is the evidence and how long are you going to stay in lockdown? I mean, you cannot stay in lockdown forever because lockdown has tremendous repercussions. And I'm not talking here about economy. I mean, people said, oh, it's the economy versus health. I'm a physician. I want to save lives. And that's my first priority. I'm talking about health versus health, eventually in the balance, because everything eventually translates to a health impact. And lockdown is, is okay uh, for a short time. It's not going to cause much harm, but like, an intervention that uh, can have severe toxicity if, if prolonged, you, you need to have the best evidence to just know when to stop it and, and to stop it as, as quickly as it is reasonable based on appraising the, the risks and the benefits that you have. Okay, good. All right, so now let's uh, uh, ask you a question about, uh, this has been also, uh, there has been some controversy about the, the estimation of the IFR, uh, that's infectious fatality rate, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and just so those that are listening and don't know what it is, that's that's the rate, the, the proportion of people who get the disease that eventually die. And it's often, the, the numbers that are most discussed, at least in, at, among the lay press, are the, the total, so they don't split it up by age, which we know is, we know it's very different by age groups. So I guess that the numbers we're getting is our estimates for like the typical demographic composition as, as, the, as the one the U.S. has. So I know that, that you, from the very early on, you had estimates that were lower than what others were saying. I, in that same March 17 article, you had it at 0.125, I think, uh, um, and you gave a range of 0.025% to 6.25. Now, then recently you have this meta-analysis where you, you, you group together all the evidence out there on, on this estimate, and I think what I read late, the list, latest one I read was about 0.25%. I don't know if that's changed. Now, the 0.25%, I'll tell you what I'm skeptical about that particular number, and it, it just, just from New York alone, although I think if you're going to say this has to do with the, the uh, nursing homes getting hit, but in New York alone, you, 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 if you just compute the number of people who have confirmed deaths by the total population, so if every single person in New York got it, yeah. you get about 0.25% IFR. So, and then, then there's also another, another meta-analysis out there that has it at 0.7. Uh, 
So can you tell us a little bit about about this this, yeah. this, 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 this that, that, the difference in results? That's a great question because I, I think that many people are completely confused and, and uh, it, it's uh, it's not so straightforward to explain. Uh, going back to the study paper uh, back in March, my estimate was that it could be anywhere in the range from 0.05 to 1%. Uh, and I, I said that because I used some very crude calculations from the Diamond Princess. And I said, well, based on that, it looks like 0.025 to 0.625, but there could be more people who may die later. I mean, and, and indeed, some people died later. And we don't know about the exact representativeness of this population. And you know, it's just a small sample. So let's say we increase it and expand the uncertainty. And I said 0.05 to 1% is the range of uncertainty. Uh, what we have learned since then is that uh, IFR can indeed vary tremendously depending on the case mix, depending on who are the people affected, who are the people eventually who, who die. And uh, that varies tremendously according to setting, population, management, uh, comorbidities, uh, how you deal with uh, the epidemic. For example, if you have nursing homes that get you know, badly hit or not. Um, and we have seen IFR vary a lot. So a single number, uh, like uh, you know, thinking of IFR as uh, Avogadro's number or as, a, as the gravitational constant uh, or as uh, uh, you know, an atomic weight uh, of, of, of an element, that's not the case. Uh, IFR can vary tremendously from one setting to another. And we do see that in uh, the various studies that have been done uh, around the world and uh, even within the US uh, we see tremendous variability. Uh, so the, the paper where I tried to put together different seroprevalence studies, I included data from 23 uh, seroprevalence studies that had presented uh, uh, full papers uh, either in peer-reviewed journals or in preprints. There is more than that, there's about 60 or 70 probably, but unfortunately most of them were press releases and you know it's not easy to, to make much sense you just have a press release or even a short uh, uh, executive report uh, you want to see a bit more about what was done exactly and how it was done and how the calculations were run was there any correction so the, the 23 that were in my latest update and I'm working on a new update that has about 35 studies that have uh, full papers uh, in some fashion um, gave a range from 0 0.02 to 0 0.86 and uh, the ones that I have included now take the range from actually 0, 0.00 <laughs> all mm -hmm. the way to more than one. Um, uh, so uh, if, if you take, for example, a very nice study by Diane Favier's team in, in San Francisco in, a, in, a, in an area of, uh, of uh, San Francisco that has a large number of uh, Latinx population, um, and they do a very thorough job. They have a pretty high Sarah prevalence, they have no one dying. Uh, you know, if you, if you divide zero by whatever, which is a pretty substantial number, you get zero. Conversely, if you go to, let's say, Queens, uh, you will get an IFR that is 1% and higher. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you have a setting where you, you just look at nursing homes, uh, studies in nursing homes, they suggest that the IFR could be 25, 26%. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have like a population which is nursing homes, your, your IFR will be astronomically high and it will be indeed devastating. So, so I think that we have to be pretty cautious in searching for a single number. Uh, the 0 0.25 that is in my paper is just a median of that uh, very heterogeneous uh, uh, estimates. I also try to provide estimates for different age groups because I think that this makes a tremendous difference. And I think that any effort looking at this should take that heterogeneity into account. Um, roughly speaking, for people less than 40, IFR is close to zero. Uh, now, nothing is zero, of course. And, and if you have you know, even children or young adults who have serious diseases, you know, immunocompromised, transplant, whatever, they can still die. But, but in the big population uh, range, IFR in people less than 40 is very close to zero. 40 to 70, um, it, it goes up 
uh, to something like uh, 0 0.02 up to 0 0.4, uh, perhaps. Uh, and again, it varies depending on the exact mix of, of the population and also whether you have uh, highly vulnerable people being represented in that population and how they're handled. And once you get to above 70, then it goes substantially higher. But even within that group, um, how high it will go depends on whether you have these extra frail, debilitated, susceptible, vulnerable individuals like the nursing home situation where it can really skyrocket. Uh, so I, I think that most of the confusion probably is derived by the fact that it's very difficult to, to present that whole spectrum of variability in the infection fatality rate. You know, people are just interested in seeing a single number and that single number is probably not representing well enough all that diversity. Okay, I think, well, I think I detected a little bit of, of confusion in, in the way you're explaining it because you're, <laughs> there, there's an, there is an IFR, if you, I guess if you're a frequentist, you think there is an IFR, whatever it is, it is. Um, but then there's the estimate of the IFR. The estimate of the IFR will of course depend on what, um, if it hits a nursing home, if it doesn't. But, but if you just condition on one person getting it, what's the chance of dying? That's, that's to me, that's the definition and that shouldn't change too much on, way, on, on how you, you know, how you, what actually ends up happening. But I'm clarifying that, uh, that point. Now, the, 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 uh, there is one, there's another, the other meta-analysis criticized your meta-analysis. I, I think I saw this somewhere on social media where they were saying that they were, that, that you, the way you, you excluded or included studies was not systematic. So do you want, do you have a response for that? Like they, they were saying you were, you were, you were leaving out some of the studies that happened to have bigger numbers for reasons like they weren't, they weren't published or they were only government reports. So can you, you I mean, I'll just give you an opportunity to yeah. say a little bit about how, how, like, but at the end of the day, you, those two papers get very different numbers. So what, what are the differences? And I think that's how they explain the difference. Yeah. They included studies that you didn't. So what is the reasoning for taking studies out and, and or leaving them in? Yeah, so so I, I hope we're talking about the same meta-analysis. Uh, Let me see, I have it here. I'll tell you what the yeah. title and, and um, oh, I hope I didn't remove it. Here it is. It's from, it's called a systematic review and meta-analysis of published research data on COVID-19 infection fatality rate by Gideon Meyerowitz, Katz, and yeah. Lee Marone. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I think this is a very poor systematic review and meta-analysis, and I think that the, the authors I checked them out. I don't think that they have ever done a systematic sort of analysis. Uh, what they do is that they put together. Wait, sorry, I missed that last. What was that last part? I missed. I, so I, 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 I was... to see, you know, what they had done. Uh, you know, what kind of track record in, in meta analysis they have. But I don't think that they have really done systematic reviews and meta analysis. And you know, this shows very quickly once you start reading their paper. They put together studies with very different designs, and they they completely uh, get extremely heterogeneous results. If you look at their I square, sometimes they're like 99% if, or if not higher, you know, they're, they're among the, the most uh, uh, mm -hmm. impressive heterogeneity metrics that I have seen, which immediately shows that- Let me show the, the main plot. Can yeah, you see it? let's take a look. Um, All right. Yeah. So uh, let's see what, yeah, actually I squared is 99.9%. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and even just visually looking at, at that plot, uh, I mean, these studies really do not belong to the same universe by, by any means. You know, doing a meta-analysis in, in this situation is, is kind of a misnomer. Uh, you have studies that, that are so enormously different and, and justifiably so. I mean, they have looked at very different populations and they have even very different designs. In fact, um, only a subset of those are based on seroprevalence studies. Others are, are based on other types of designs that have very different assumptions and very different uh, ways of obtaining estimates. And I think that they have another figure as well uh, that tries to separate seroprevalence studies from others. Let's see, is that the one? Um, is according to country? No, maybe um, month. Uh, you, can keep, you can continue, I'll try to find yeah. it. 
Uh, yeah, here you go. So okay. you have here uh, non-serological and serological. Uh, if you look at the serological, they have like, uh, uh, I think a dozen studies or, or something like that. And uh, I have included 23. And uh -huh. uh, the major ones that I have not included because there were no full papers, uh, I do discuss because I, I want to give the full picture about uh, uh, what these uh, studies show. For example, Spain is, is a study that is not included in, in my table, but I do discuss it in great length in the discussion. And now this study has been published in Lancet uh, like two days ago, so in my update, it will be included. Um, you know, it, talk, talking about systematic, uh, they have missed about 80% in that plot that they show. And uh, you see, again, even limited to serological, the I square is 99.9%, which is a joke, you know, to do a meta-analysis with, with a 99.9% uh, I square. I mean, you're just saying these studies do not come from the same universe. They're, they're uh, uh, co completely, completely heterogeneous. The, the heterogeneity um, is not just chance. It, it, it's a very genuine heterogeneity, as you expect, based on, on what I was referring to earlier. I'm, I'm a very big proponent of meta-analysis, as you know, but, uh, you know, just throwing anything in a meta-analysis just to get a summary estimate, in that case, 0 0.53, if I can read that uh, uh, diamond for the serological studies, I don't think that this is the way to go. I, I, I think that you need to, to respect that these are very different uh, studies looking at very different populations with very different case mix and very different bound. I, I, I would be more interested in understanding why they're so different rather than just try to get a single estimate. You know, all the studies that we have in Asia, for example, in countries like Japan and, and uh, um, you know, Japan, we have studies that show an IFR of 0 0.02. That's, that's, you know, very weird. It's like, uh, uh, like 50 times or less uh, less or, or even more different compared to, to New York City, for example. Yeah, it's uh, a very, very different population, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, Japan has an elderly population, so just the age distribution alone does not explain that situation. If you go to Singapore, I haven't seen a, a seroprevalence study yet, or maybe have missed it, but uh, they have detected 43,000 cases because they're very thorough. Uh, they do what I think every country should have done, and unfortunately in the U.S. we didn't do that. They just had very intensive testing early on and then contact tracing of all the cases that they found. Uh, so they found 43,000 cases documented with PS PCR, and they only have 26 deaths. If, if you run the IFR for that, this is 0.06%, and I'm sure that they have missed some cases. So it, you know, it's probably half of that, who knows, maybe 0.03%. Again. How can you combine these numbers with uh, with New York City or with uh, with Barcelona? Uh, it, it's uh, or or Bergamo. It's uh, it's completely meaningless. You need to to understand the diversity and try to learn from the diversity. Try to avoid having more Bergamos. Try to avoid having more New York Cities. Try to have more Singapore's, if you wish. And to some extent, I think we can we can do that if we use the right measures of dealing with the pandemic. Am I here? I don't know if I'm coming through. It's stuck here. Uh, okay, so sorry, but um, I want to defend that paper a little bit. Not, not that I'm an expert in meta-analysis, but first, now, not, what you're saying now is that there, there's different IFRs. The Japan IFR, and then there's the New York IFR, and then there's the San Francisco IFR, etc. That makes sense because there's different populations. If it's, I've seen a study where they that it's claiming obesity is one of the biggest predictors of death, in which case you could see why Japan is lower IFR. They're very um, healthy in terms of, of that particular uh, health outcome. So which IFR are you estimating in your paper? I, I'm, I'm trying to show the data that we have about IFR and that they're very heterogeneous. You can present medians, I do present a median if you wish, uh, but you have to, to focus on, on the diversity mm -hmm. and, and then try to understand why that diversity exists. You know, the, the age structure is one reason. Uh, comorbidities could be another reason. You mentioned obesity. It could be, although 
um, it's not enough to explain such huge diversity. Uh, the, the best data that we have on different comorbidities come from the uh, probably the Open Safely data set uh, in the UK by Ben Paul Dakerstein, um, where they have merged deaths from coronavirus against uh, uh, electronic health records on millions of people from the UK health system, uh, NHS. And, you know, the, the, the hazard ratios for single comorbidities are not that large, so as to, to create that huge difference. For example, obesity. Uh, some comorbidities actually seem to not increase the risk of death at all, like hypertension. Uh, diabetes seems to do more of uh, an increased harm. Uh, asthma, very, very little. Heart disease, only modestly so. Deprivation is, is a huge factor. Uh, as I mentioned before, COVID-19 is a disease of inequality. Uh, lots of people who are, are, you know, people who we have not taken proper care of, uh, they become victims. And I, I, I do worry about that. So, you know, a country that has inequalities, unfortunately, the U.S. has a lot of inequalities. A country that has a lot of people who are marginalized um, can have a boost in the IFR that is, that is very substantial. A country that has lots of nursing homes, uh, again, uh, you know, Greece had a very good uh, trajectory with, with a very low number of deaths, even though Greeks uh, have lots of elderly people, uh, but we don't have nursing homes. You know, we, we have our elderly stay with, uh, with, uh, with the family and taken good care of. Um, so there's really no nursing homes to have these massacres that happen in other European countries and in many places in the US. So I, I think we need to understand these dynamics. We need to learn from them. We need to, to find out things that can help us protect people, uh, avoid deaths, uh, decrease that burden of inequality that COVID is, is creating rather than just get a single number with an I square of 99.99%. I, I, I don't see that this is useful. I, I think that understanding the diversity, and uh, this is something that I have written from the very beginning. I started working on meta-analysis over more than 20, 25 years now, I think is more important. So you're, so, okay, so you're arguing that we shouldn't be reporting a, a, a median IFR. It's not useful um, because the, 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 the diverse the, the difference is, is what's more interesting here. Uh, and I, I think I agree with that. But then when we communicate, I mean, I just think what, what you see in the, in the, in the arguments on lay press is there, it's just that one number and people arguing about it. Yeah. I mean, the discussion about how much it changes is, is not out there. And what and then I'll say about this paper is that I like that they, they show it, right? You see it, you see all their estimates, um, they're clearly shown and, and you can see what you just described. And then the I square being high, well, that's just the reality. Of, of this and and there's another source of variability here perhaps as big as as the natural one is how it's being measured serological versus not how in a country that that has more testing it will be higher because we'll have more confirmed cases maybe or I don't know, whatever yeah. whatever wherever, whichever it is so that that's another source of variability that is is, is really nuisance we don't want it it's not it's not nat natural and, and, and interesting right or, or, or informative, but, but but it's there, and then in this paper, you can see that you can see the very how how much it is all over the place. But I yeah. think maybe the main the main thing we're, we're we're agreeing on here is that reporting one number isn't useful. Um, it changes across populations. It it changes um, across age groups, across health the health outcomes, etc. Um, and by the way, I, I want to one one uh, question on on the is coming through that I, I thought I had explained it, but maybe they missed it. What's a IFR? IFR is an infection fatality rate. It's the rate of people who die among those that had, that, that got to this. Is that right? Is that correct? Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Good. So let, let's just add one more point here, which is a bit technical, but I think is important, which is one more reason why I'm skeptical of uh, a formal meta-analysis. Um, meta-analysis depends on using variance estimates for each of the studies, um, which means that if you have a study that has a small variance, it has more weight in the calculations. If you do a poor job, you will have uh, 
a, a smaller variance. <laughs> uh, it, it's not only if you have a bigger sample that you would have a smaller variance. If you do a poor job for adjusting for test performance, for uh, the, the structure of the population, for the sampling, for the representativeness, uh, for other sources of uncertainty, you will get a more tight confidence interval, a smaller variance compared to if you do a more thorough job of trying to take these additional factors into account. So, you know, this is counterintuitive that it's not only larger studies that tend to get um, uh, more weight, it's also more sloppy studies that tend to get more weight, and I, I don't like this. Now, if you have an I square of 99.9%, um, at the end of the day, what you end up calculating in that diamond is, is, is just an average. <laughs> you know, you, you could forget about the analysis because the, the weight of the studies in the random effects becomes pretty much equal. With, with I squared of 99.9%, uh, the, the, the random, you know, the, 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 the tau square is, is so huge that all the studies eventually tend to be equal. Uh, and a follow-up question. So I, 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 I'm not sure what to think about, uh, about, about this, this criticism about the one number. I, I mean, I, I like, I prefer papers that show me the data in its rawest form in some figure, even if they do later some more complicated analysis, that's fine too. Yeah. But I, I want to see the, where it all comes from and have a good explanation of how they got to the final number they got to. Maybe I won't agree with that part, but uh, but the fact that they have these figures, I, I do like that, and I and it does convince me that it is uh, it is in the U.S. at least. I'm, uh, it, it at least agrees with what I what, with with a, an estimate that I've kind of come up with, just not really an estimate, but just an intuition of where where it is, and it is hot, it is going to be around there, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, and it, this comes from the, the the work that I've done in estimating excess mortalities in the U.S. I mean, it does look like just compared to the 2018 flu, it does look like we're seeing between three and five times more deaths um, with COVID than we did with the flu of 2008, which, which was pretty bad uh, compared to other flu. So, so, that, so given that the flu is around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, then, then it makes sense that, the, that, that COVID is, at least in the US, is around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, at least to me that's what uh so maybe there's some bias in, in my view of this paper in favor of this paper because because it agrees with some of the work i've done with with excess mortality yeah no, Sorry, I, I think was this it? is valuable work and i think uh, different ways of, I, I think that work on excess mortality is, is really valuable and I, i'm glad that we're, you're working on on this field uh but I, I, again um you know, a single number will not do justice to different states or different locations around the country. Uh, if you look at the recently released data from CDC on seroprevalence in six states, if you run the IFR for these six states, they're vastly different. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Utah, they're you know, very close to 0.1. Uh, in uh, Connecticut, they're like one. Uh, so, you know, they could be like 10 times uh, different in, in uh, just that first wave of CDC released uh, results. And, and the other studies that we have seen published uh, in the U.S. also give very different uh, estimates. Um, I, I would also be a little bit cautious about excess mortality. They're valuable data, but uh, anyone who has tried to fill out a death certificate, you know, here I'm, I'm coming back to uh, the years when I was a physician and I, was, uh, I had to, to write death certificates. Uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult not to make mistakes in, in death certificates. Um, and I, I, we have multiple, multiple studies, multiple studies, uh, preceding, of course, the COVID-19 era. Death certificate error rates can be from 50% to 90%. Uh, it, it's almost ubiquitous when we talk about small errors, but even for major errors are very, very common. Now, if you have that situation where you have a crisis, you have uh, people dying, especially in locations like New York, uh, a clear disaster happening, uh, people who are overworked trying to fill out death certificates, getting um, you know, pressure that uh, it's a notifiable disease, you need to note it no matter what. I, I think we need to wait for the dust to settle to know how many of these deaths were by, from uh, COVID-19, how many were with COVID-19, 
how many were induced by the crisis? Uh, you know, the, the fact that we had the pandemic, the fact that we had the lockdown, uh, we know that there's several reasons why you may get excess deaths. I mean, people with heart attacks do not go to the hospitals. Uh, heart attack is the key reason that one can die and hospitals can really take care of that and reduce mortality substantially. So I think we need more of that work. I'm, I'm very glad that people like you who are really the best of the best are, are working to try to elucidate what's going on there. But uh, I, I really want to, to really look at these data very carefully once the deaths have settled once we don't have all that pressure in the environment where you have lots of media and people with ideologies who want to interpret things in single numbers and in one way or another, uh, it's not easy to do you know, objective science under the circumstances. We, we just need a little bit of a distance to, to be able to understand what happened. Okay, Good. so can you tell us briefly what you think? Uh, I'm sorry, we're going over the 30 minutes. I hope you don't mind. We have Please. More I, I, I think it's a great discussion. So, um, what what it what what it what do you how do you think it compares to COVID nineteen to the flu? Let's say the two thousand eight flu. What is your current thoughts or your current uh, intuition on how much worse or if it was just as bad? Oh goodness! What, 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 I, I, what do you I think? Have, uh, I have tried to to talk about this and I have failed <laughs> bitterly, I believe, because. Uh, I think that people misinterpret the comparisons, but let me try. Um, mm -hmm. We can make the comparison at different levels. Uh, one, let's say easy level, although there's nothing easy, is to look at the total number of deaths. Uh, so influenza worldwide typically is between 350,000 to 700,000 per year. In bad years like 1957 or 1968, it could be 1 million plus. Now, COVID-19, with all the limitations of undercounted deaths, overcounted deaths, you know, all, all that dust that hasn't settled yet, if we just look at the numbers and say, okay, this is, let's say, overcounting and uh, undercounting is about the same, although it may not be, uh, we're talking about 520,000 to date, and of course, there's more uh, that are growing. But, but pretty much, we're at the end of, let's say, a complete season, because once you get into fall, this is like a second year uh, and you know second year starts counting for flu or for other disease as well so at, at a global level it seems to be in in the same range but this is a composite not just of the infection fatality rate it's also a composite of how many people are infected uh, you know it's it's two pieces so it doesn't necessarily mean that the infection fatality rate is the same so you're now, saying it's, it's 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 comparable to the worst flu season in 57 or to the typical flu season? Well, typical flu season is 350 to 700,000 worldwide. Bad flu season is 1 million, perhaps up to 4 million, if you look at, at some, uh, let's say, indirect estimates uh, of mortality, because we've not counted influenza deaths one by one, the way that we're trying to do with COVID-19, which is very weird. Um, so I, I think that this is still an evolution. I think, again, when the dust settles, we will be able to make a, a more, uh, let's say, uh, accurate comparison. But what we do know is that the two viruses have a very different footprint epidemiologically. We know that influenza kills about 30,000 kids around the world every year with a range from 10,000 to 90,000. COVID-19 does cause probably Kawasaki disease in, and syndrome in, in uh, children, but Typically, it doesn't really kill children and young adults. So I would say for people who are younger than 30, uh, influenza is a greater threat compared to COVID-19. Once you get to middle age, like 30 to 50, it's probably about the same. Once you get to elderly people and debilitated people, nursing homes, it, it's a complete disaster, you know, nothing to compare. Major difference that needs to be taken into account. For influenza, we have a vaccine. For COVID-19, we don't have a vaccine. And I hope we do get one. Uh, and, and influenza vaccine, for all the debates that have been ongoing, is very effective, actually, to avoid nursing home disasters and hospital nosocomial infection disasters, which is where we get the huge massacres with COVID-19. We do get occasionally nosocomial outbreaks with influenza, but they're not that common. Why? Because you know, 80, 90% or more of healthcare personnel are vaccinated for influenza. We don't have a vaccine for COVID-19. 
Mm -hmm. We do get occasionally outbreaks with influenza in nursing homes, and we do get outbreaks actually when we've gotten variety coronaviruses in nursing homes, and when they happen, they, they, we have like 10% or higher infection fatality rate in these populations, even with garden variety coronaviruses, we have a vaccine for influenza. So we don't get those so commonly. We are vaccinated against the garden variety coronaviruses since we were kids, but got infected before they grew you know, to an age of five. And now we have some reinfections of these viruses now and then. We don't have that necessarily for, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, Although, yeah, you, you said you, you meant flu earlier when you said COVID. Okay, you, you said we get vaccinated for, for COVID, but you meant flu. Yes, sorry, <laughs> obviously. Um, so I, I think that we need to be careful in making that comparison. Um, also, we need to be careful about making the comparison in, in specific countries. Um, for example, in the US, there's no doubt that COVID-19 resulted in more deaths in influenza this season. Uh, but if you go to other countries, if you go to Germany, for example, the number of deaths from COVID-19 is, you know, probably less compared to an average well, season. But, but they did a lockdown, so you don't know what would have happened had sure, they not. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, that I, I'm trying to look at the picture of, of, of what we see, and, and I'm not saying that we should have just gone ahead and continue having uh, soccer games and uh, mass gatherings and uh, I mean, it goes without saying that, that, you know, if you have a problem, you try to deal with that with what you know, and hopefully downstream you, you fine tune your response. But it, it would be weird to say that uh, we would have a major problem and, and we would just stay and, and stare at it or, or even worse, uh, have people massively exposed. So this is a very related question to this discussion we're just having from an anonymous uh, attendee. Could you reflect a bit on what we have learned from the failure of science communication, that's in quotes, all along the pandemic time and how we might formulate general principles to guide better explanations and data presentations going forward and the next time? That's a great question. And uh, I'm struggling with that because uh, I, I see that um, it is not easy. Uh, science communication is difficult even under calm circumstances, even under, let's say, uh, control situations where you don't have urgent things that need to be communicated, uh, where, when you don't have polarized opinions, when you don't have ideologies, when you don't have politics uh, messing with science, even, even under the best circumstances, science communication is very difficult. You now, Gerd Gigerenzer, for example, has done tremendous work uh, showing that unfortunately our education system does not allow the general public to, to be uh, literate and numerate. Uh, so trying to, to convey numbers to a general public is, is a very, very difficult task. E even if everything is, is under control and you have all the leisure to reflect on it and read it and try to understand it. Once you're in a crisis with all these superimposed situations uh, on top of it, it's a complete mess. And once you have then social media and media uh, right and left, you know, trying to kind of use uh, numbers uh, to their benefit, Th that's, that's a complete disaster. You, know, you, know, you, you, you get complete distortion. So I think as a scientist um, who has failed <laughs> repeatedly in this type of, of science communication, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think, um, I'm not sure I can give advice, but whatever that advice might be worth it, is try to be calm, try to be thorough, um, try to be as objective, try to leave as much uncertainty if there is uncertainty, and try to avoid uh, traps of having your statements misrepresented. That's, that's very difficult though. Um, trying does not mean that you'll succeed. So you think you, so can you give us examples of cases where you think your statements have been um, misinterpreted or miscommunicated? I, I think that, that many of my statements were used widely and wildly <laughs> in media um, of, of different backgrounds, different ideologies, um, with completely different twists depending on what these ideologies were. And, uh, you know, I, that's, uh, that's not good. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, that, that complicates matters. 
it, it's, it's very difficult when you want to convey a number, let's say infection fatality rate or you know, number of deaths or, uh, or a risk estimate to, to try to, to decide ahead of time. So how is that number going to be used by right wing media or by left wing media or by, uh, I, I don't know, it, it's, uh, you know, you, you have to say the estimate. I mean, you have to be honest to your science. But trying to understand how it will be distorted is very difficult. And I, I have to say, I don't have an easy explanation, an, an easy solution to that. Um, it's, um, it's a challenge to, to, be, to be dealt with. And, and I, I, I can only think that trying to be accurate is, is the best you can do. Um, but even then, you, you can get into trouble. Well, so I'll, I'll share what my opinion on some of this yeah. is. And I, I, for f several years now, have thought, and, and my, it's get, my opinion is getting stronger, is that pu public relations, putting out press releases and that kind of stuff is bad. I don't think we should be doing it. Um, yeah. Maybe we wait a little bit. Definitely not with preprints. I would say not even after the paper comes out. Just... Maybe mm -hmm. maybe yeah. what we should be doing is is going on, on if if we get if we get called by a reporter we we to answer a question we can do, of course you can do that maybe our our press re, our press offices should be getting us out there to explain concepts not our own work just explain yeah. stuff I mean I don't I don't know it just doesn't uh, seem uh, like we should be I I cannot agree more with you. So no and more pre you're not putting no more press releases. Do we call like uh, Stanford so, and Dana Barber? So let, 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 let me let me uh, elaborate on that because we, we are entirely on the same wavelength. Uh, it may sound a bit weird to you, but uh, personally, I do not like to have press releases, and I do not make press releases for my work unless explicitly I'm I'm asked. You know, like the journal says, you know, here's a press release that we're trying to we will get out, and you know, I have to edit that. Then of course. Uh, Personally, my stance is not to make press releases, and, and I don't make press releases. In, in, uh, in the COVID-19 uh, situation, personally, I didn't make any press release myself. A uh, study that I was involved with, the, the Santa Clara study, where I was the 16th author, teen author, I didn't make a press release, and actually, I consulted with the Stanford Communications Office on how to avoid talking to the media, <laughs> because... I, I was bombarded right and left uh, from so many media. And I, I, I said, you know, I cannot escape. I, I think that these are highly visible situations. I think that messages get distorted. I need to talk. I, mean, I, I cannot say that I'm, I'm not talking to anyone. Can we somehow select only a few uh, outlets in a balanced way? So I talked several times to CNN. I did talk to Fox. And I think many people felt that, oh, he has conservative ideology if he talks to Fox, which is goodness, this is a joke, uh, honestly. And, and then, even then, my effort was to try to give messages based on multiple studies. You know, my reading of the literature, rather than focusing on single studies, rather, let alone single studies that uh, are still in a preprint version. I also need to, to clarify that for the Santa Clara study, um, we made very stringent efforts, and, and we succeeded in that, that we will not make any press announcement, any press release, any mention in the media before the full preprint was published, which is exactly, if you look at the 60 seroprelevant studies that have been done, almost all of them, as soon as they had the data, like the same day, perhaps the same afternoon, they went to have a press conference. And, and you know, neither myself nor others in, in the team did that. We said we will not have anything to do with the press about the study until we have at least a full paper deposited in and made publicly available in, in Meta Archive. So I'm, uh, I would just take it a step further. Just wait, we wait, wait until you have 25 citations or something. And I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll give you a, a quote, a quote. Let's see if you know who said this. The harder a scientific field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. <laughs> <laughs> who said that? Yes. Who, knows that? who said that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, Santa Clara study has like 200 citations already. Uh, mm, on, but, on. But, but regardless, regardless, I fully agree with you. 
that we need to be very, very cautious with, uh, with talking to media. I, 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 I fully endorse that. All right. So I think we're going to have, we're going to get shut down soon. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks for speaking. I'll, I'll summarize some of what we said for the audience. I, that I, that I learned, I learned that you were, you're not against the lockdown as I thought. Um, I had I, a, a, an opinion I had formed based on what I've read and seen before that you do think the, the IFR is something we have, we don't, we shouldn't just look at one number. We sh it, it depends on where you are and the circumstances that, that you, um, uh, you are, you do, you do acknowledge that the, 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 in the United States, COVID has been worse than, than the flu, although in other places, not as much. And then finally, that we should stop putting out press releases as academics, at least at the very beginning of uh, uh, this, or when a paper is just, just in its early stages. Is that fair? That's a, that's a very good summary. And uh, uh, eventually, what matters is human lives. I mean, you know, we're not in research just for curiosity. So uh, it, it's not just academic debates. And I think that all of us need to reflect on that repeatedly. Eventually, we want to save as many lives as possible. And sometimes saving lives is not easy. And some bad actions are just uh, starting with good intentions. So let's try to be vigilant. All right. Well, thank you. A million all right. Things. Okay, I'm gonna. This is gonna be very abrupt because this is how the, the the software is set up. I'm gonna hit the, the button and and then it's just gonna shut down. So thanks again, and uh, I'll see you around. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too.